we will uh, start a recording we will keep a copy of this and no put problem. on our uh, youtube link if you don't mind obviously sure 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 okay i think uh, now we can start uh, start i will just um, uh, introduce you uh, very uh, briefly and then we can go ahead okay so today we have uh, okay first of all thank you all to join this uh, particular colloquium and this colloquium we have invited professor dipankar banerjee from indian uh, he 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 is director of aryabhatta institute of observational sciences and he is also part of indian institute of astrophysics in bangalore he is a he he will be talking about aditya mission which is a space based uh, solar uh, mission uh, which will be launched in coming years and his main research is focused to obviously solar uh, physics related so professor banerjee is really very uh, energetic uh, person when he talks when he gives seminars so uh, we will hear him and and the updates for, uh, related to aditya so i will not waste much of your time and i will just uh, ask uh, professor banerjee to proceed uh, thank you professor hello okay there is Ooh. oops again okay there is uh, some problem with the dipanka i think connection issue it looks like he's muted and uh, no now it's he's back yeah uh see so you are muted dipanka i'm i'm sorry yeah i mean the by default when i log in it it gets muted yeah so uh, yeah just let me know when i should start i'm sorry for this yeah, uh, yeah please should please please start please go okay. ahead okay uh thank you very much and please let me know because when i am full screen sometimes you know it creates an issue i don't uh, see the any other you know windows popping up so please interrupt uh, in case you know you find any trouble okay yeah, yeah. definitely yeah so thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, talk about uh, you know uh, where i am from and also a little bit on our uh, forthcoming mission from indian uh, space platform called aditya aditya means actually uh, sun so that's why uh, you know it's named uh, like that uh, in the first half i will try to give you a very quick overview about uh, you know ADIS, which is the Aryabhatta Research Institute of Observational Sciences, where I am at this point, and we will also talk about you know other facilities very very briefly, which is there from India. And since uh, you know as Elizabeth pointed out, I, my original roots are still in in Institute of Astrophysics, uh, which hosts this uh, you know uh, high altitude telescope. It's a two meter Himalayan Chandra telescope situated in a uh, location called Hanle, which is about two hundred kilometers from Leh. This is about fourteen thousand five hundred feet uh, altitude, and uh, this is operational more than a decade now. But of course, uh, our first, uh, you know, uh, telescope of uh, this uh, size was, uh, you know, uh, was done indigenously in India uh, at a place called Kavalur, and there it's named as a Vainu Bapu uh, uh, Telescope in our early eighties. And it is still functional, and majority of the astronomical, observational sciences and research uh, PhDs and all that from India is based on uh, you know data from this telescope, uh, and then uh, more uh, last decade or so it's from uh, Hanley. I will talk about very briefly about the 3.6 meter, the largest telescope from this part of the globe, uh, uh, which is called the Devasal Optical Telescope. In my next slide. So ARIS uh, is, uh, you know, a, one of the autonomous institutes uh, uh, under uh, DST, Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. We do astronomy, astrophysics, and also we have a good facility about atmospheric sciences. I will not talk about much of the atmospheric sciences today, but we have ST radar uh, facilities. We have LIDAR. 
So primarily, uh, you know, looking at the stratosphere and troposphere. And also we have a lot of atmospheric chemistry uh, observations done from this campus at Manora Peak, which is about 7,000 feet from the ground level uh, where I am sitting right now. And from our new campus uh, also uh, called Davisthal. So it has a lot of legacy because it used to be called as UP State Observatory. So it, has, it had a one meter telescope more than 50 years. It's still functional. And that has made uh, certain discoveries uh, as it's pointed out here. At this point, we uh, are proud uh, host of this India's largest optical telescope at uh, 2.5 uh, kilometer altitude and this radar facility, which I just mentioned. Uh, this is the, the top figure shows the Manura Peak campus. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the circle here. I'm in, in one of the rooms out, uh, out here, which hosts the older telescopes. But more recently, we have moved to uh, Devasal, uh, 50 kilometer east of uh, Nainital city. And this is hosting a few facilities, which I will be talking about very briefly. This is a close up of the uh, Manura Peak Nanital campus. I'm actually right now sitting in this uh, you know, room, uh, the window uh, looking uh, the left side. And we have a uh, you know, one meter telescope uh, on, our, on our backyard, along with a you know, 50 centimeter uh, telescope also, and other uh, you know, hostel facilities and uh, engineering workshops. So majority of these activities are here. Uh, we also have a, a small, uh, you know, 15 centimeter solar telescope, uh, which is operation from 1993 onwards, primarily looking at solar flares with the H alpha filter. Uh, so these are the two other telescopes which I already mentioned. Uh, a close up of uh, the uh, one meter telescope. Uh, this is again, one of the oldest uh, in, the, in the country. Uh, incidentally, this telescope was, I mean, two telescopes were procured. One was sent to uh, Kavalur, where this Vainubapu telescope came up later on in the more uh, in the south of India. And one came for UP State Observatory in this, uh, you know, hilltop. And these two are, you know, the German make, and you can make out, you know, that still, uh, you know, our PhD students after their uh, dinner, they just walk into that uh, telescope and do some observations as well. This is the solar telescope, which I was referring to, uh, just looking at uh, H alpha uh, flares. Now in the Devastal campus, before this 3.6 meter telescope uh, came up, it took a, quite a while to make that construction to do a better site characterization and also start certain operations and all that. We procured a uh, you know, 1.3 meter uh, telescope, uh, just optical telescope with the, with the imaging facility from DFM. And that is still operational from 2010. It has actually produced you know, many, many uh, PhDs and, and so on, because it's a very robust telescope. A lot of uh, you know, uh, optical uh, imaging observations are still done. And it does provide us a very good follow-up and complementarity to our 3.6 meter facility, which has, of course, uh, many more back-end instrument, including a infrared uh, spectrograph come imager and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, fent object uh, spectrograph, uh, a good uh, CCD for imaging and, and so on. So this first slide was from 2016 onwards. We had a little bit of hiccup uh, uh, a couple of years back, but the telescope is back completely in full operations with uh, proposals uh, being evaluated uh, by a time allocation committee. And typically we get, uh, you know, three to 3.5 times oversubscribed. And, uh, and the nights are, are been allotted. We have a very unique facility um, called four meter liquid mirror telescope where uh, you know, everything is ready uh, as uh, some of you must be fully aware rather than an optical mirror, we have mercury as a reflecting uh, surface. It's, it's a big ball which rotates and then it creates a, a very good four meter reflecting surface. But uh, the only uh, limitations is that it cannot be maneuvered uh, into the sky. So it looks at, uh, at the zenith and it is a large field of view, essentially for looking at transients and so on. We were all ready for this uh, you know, first slide, but unfortunately, because of the pandemic, everything is on halted because this is a, also an international uh, project where we have uh, you know, active partner from Belgium and, and Canada. And uh, since they were also not able to travel, so this is, uh, we are just waiting as and when situation prevails, we will plan for our first slide, which we are now at this point of time aiming for the end of this year. 
So this is a close-up of this uh, 1.3 meter uh, telescope, the DFM telescope, uh, and you could see the beautiful uh, Himalayan uh, mountain range. There are uh, n number of peaks. So every day, uh, morning and evening hours, you could get a very beautiful uh, you know, view of the entire Himalayan site. So it's really a uh, Devasthal, uh, in Sanskrit, Devta means God, and Sthal means place. So it's a place of the God. Uh, so it's it literally, it is a place of, you know, such a divine, uh, you know, uh, work. Uh, our, of course, uh, instruments are these telescopes. So we do enjoy, uh, you know, and feel fortunate to be able to do our work uh, from a, such a wonderful site. This is a close up of this uh, 3.6 meter telescope. And uh, this is a view from outside. Uh, the dome design was uh, quite a tricky thing. We do have lots of fans, what you can see here, because as uh, all of you know, when the observation starts, uh, maintaining the temperature inside uh, and outside is, is a quite a bit of challenge. So a lot of experimentation was done designing these uh, huge uh, fans, uh, but now we are still experimenting with, uh, you know, the operations of these fan and which direction, whether all the fans are need to be operated or not. I'm just giving you a glimpses that these are, you know, operational, always day-to-day -day, uh, learning and, and challenges, which allows you to, you know, move forward. But it's a beautiful site. So uh, we continue doing our uh, seeing uh, measurements. And this particular site is, uh, site is going to get, uh, few more telescopes in the near future. We are building uh, our science center there and, and uh, several labs there. ISRO incidentally is very much interested to do uh, space debris uh, you know, monitoring. And uh, we have signed an MOU and uh, very soon we will start a construction of a one meter class telescope uh, just for that purpose of space debris. But as you know, they will do their work uh, for a certain time of uh, the night, the rest of the night, we will have our, our own operations as well. So that's the uh, dealing. So this is a close up of that uh, four meter uh, liquid meter telescope. And I think this is a very fascinating, uh, you know, uh, facility because such a facility uh, is not operational anywhere in the globe at this point of time. So we are looking forward to a challenging task here like this. So that's a brief introduction about uh, about Aries and very briefly about IA. IA has many many facilities, five uh, you know observatories across India. So I won't have time to talk about it. But since I promised to talk about Aditya mission, which is a dedicated first. Uh, uh, solar mission uh, from Indian space platform. We are planning to go to Lagrange at one point. So this is again a, a huge challenging task because as you know, majority of the space uh, you know, satellites are either in geosynchronous or, or near Earth, uh, uh, you know, Leo orbit. But uh, India has, uh, after the su successful uh, uh, moon and the Mars mission has been more adventurous to go farther and farther away. And as you know, of course, NASA ESA has uh, successfully, uh, you know, traveled to L1. Uh, so uh, India wanted to uh, suit, uh, you know, just uh, following that success. So we are going to L1. So that's uh, a, a also a very good vantage point for continuous solar observation. So, uh, you know, the rest of the part of the my talk, I will uh, talk about sun. But before I go to Aditya's uh, payload description, I thought you know, I will just introduce a few uh, you know, elements uh, because I, I understand majority of you are not from solar background. So just to impress on uh, you know, some of these uh, uh, you know, uh, scientific objectives, what we are planning, why do we have such uh, things in mind uh, is uh, you, you know, uh, looking at uh, you know, this. Uh, yeah, is there any, any problem? Uh, Sunil? No, uh, go ahead, please. Uh, no okay. question. Just, just uh, some a little noise I heard, so I thought, you know, in case, you know, there is a problem. Okay, so this is a picture of uh, 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 solar atmosphere, namely a coronal picture taken from Solar Dynamic Observatory, where you can see very clearly the sun is a very dynamic star, always changing. And why do we need to study a sun in such greater detail? Because the more we learn about sun, we can extrapolate that idea to other stars and other astrophysical objects. So that's the intention. This is the closest star, which we can resolve to such a degree as you see from this picture. So there are regions where there are strong magnetic field regions underneath sunspots. 
uh, which are confined with uh, you know uh, coronal loop like structures and there are regions which are called so called quiet sun but uh, today there is nothing quiet in the sun we know that there are some form of dynamics are visible or observed in any part of the sun at any any instance but the nature of these uh, variabilities are different so we need to have observing capabilities of you know the fastest time cadence fastest spatial resolution spectral resolutions and so on so we all look for these things in the case of the sun uh, and that's the uh, motivation for making new new instruments very briefly uh, we all know sun is a very uh, you know magnetic star and there are combination of closed field regions and open field regions the closed field regions are generally connected with sunspots underneath and uh, they are called uh, active regions and the rest of the places are called quiet sun as i indicated already but there are also polar regions in the sun where it is believed that the uh, magnetic field lines are more open there is another very big challenge in terms of the magnetic field uh, studies of the sun is that we could measure the magnetic field only on the photospheric level uh, very confidently or regularly and systematically through either zeeman effect or through spectropolarimetry there are certain advancement in spectropolarimetric observations from from chromospheric level which is the next higher level but uh, still we do not have a regular direct observations of the coronal field so this is one of the dark uh, energy problem of uh, solar physics to get a better handle about the magnetic field in the corona so our mission uh, will also have a dedicated instrument for that and as uh, I, it's a more of a generic statement these are uh, you know theoretical uh, models based on photospheric observations and they do do extrapolations and so on and that gives you an impression that the, the, the magnetic topology of the structure in the atmosphere is probably something like this and if we compare that with with uv observations uh, they do look uh, quite similar there are differences but uh, generally the the topological structure seems to be pretty uh, consistent with standard you know uh, theoretical models and their extrapolations and so on but we want to go beyond that uh, because this is a very static picture of the solar uh, uh, the magnetic structures and uh, we know that the majority of the dynamics is completely controlled by the by the changes in the magnetic field to, to understand the changes in the magnetic field we need to understand the magnetic field at different layers in the atmosphere of the sun and how it goes so then of course uh, comes the question of um, uh, solar flares and uh, when magnetic forces uh, above sunspots become tangled and break apart violent storms can burst from the sun this is the main source of our strongest space weather uh, events so space weather is a new uh, uh, subject or field which has emerged after the space era where we need to protect the interplanetary space from the space assets and also our interplanetary uh, magnetic field it changes earth's magnetic magnetosphere it changes and, uh, and and the storms the geomagnetic storms and so on so it's very important to have a better understanding about the uh, you know about the processes which are responsible for these you know ejections and so on from the sun so solar flares is uh, one such uh, definite source and we do understand that the magnetic field uh, you know reconnection is probably one such process which is responsible for this so flares are quick and intense but smaller explosions than and then cmes the coronal mass ejections are bright flashes sometimes followed by a burst of high energy particles that can travel at half the speed of the light large flares can occur several times a year when the sun is near its peak activity i i don't have time to talk about uh, the solar and long term variability which is called the solar cycle incidentally just i like to mention i do a lot of work with the kodaikanal uh, 100 years uh, digitized uh, uh, thing i was responsible for the digitization and uh, eventually making the data available to the global community and i do a lot of work on the long term study of the sun including some dynamo models and all that but today i don't have time to talk about it but if anybody is interested please share that information with with other colleagues that in india uh, we have one of the longest uh, you know uh, solar data archive uh, there are three major sources one in us one in uh, one in europe and one in india from kodaikanal solar observatory of course this uh, observatory was maintained by the britishers and it has uh, one of the richest uh, you know solar archive 
So today I'm just only talking about the short time variability here. So as you see here, example of, uh, of the CMEs, but the uh, important element what I want to also emphasize today, uh, of course, you are all astronomers, you know the importance of the multi-wavelength aspect of it. And here, uh, solar physics is, I think, shows the way that how important it is to include multi-wavelength aspect. Otherwise, you would not have seen this at all if you would have restricted our observations to ground-based uh, you know, uh, wavelengths as well. So CMEs are large solar storms that can blast out a cloud billions of tons of particles at over 2 million kilometers per hour. Smaller ones can occur almost any day. Uh, the clouds reach Earth's orbit in one to three days. So this is again another area where we do get some, uh, you know, some uh, time to uh, really evaluate what kind of ejecta has come from the sun, what kind of uh, propagation it will uh, follow within the interplanetary space. But then we need to understand the interplanetary magnetic field structures, the uh, properties of the ejecta with velocities, its density, its mass, and so on. If we have all that and combining with observations and numerical simulations, we can predict such arrival times of these CMEs and so on. So this is again, another very uh, important area uh, where we, uh, some of us uh, uh, work. So this is what is called uh, uh, space weather. This is again, uh, the CMEs as observed from the stereo spacecraft. Stereo was a, a, a fascinating mission from uh, NASA where two identical spacecraft with same suite of instruments were uh, you know, uh, rotating around uh, the sun uh, with the different uh, you know, uh, phases. So you have a possibility of looking at the sun from two different vantage points. The idea was that when you are looking uh, from two vantage points, you have uh, two uh, different viewpoints and then through stereoscopic reconstruction, you can get a better, uh, you know, uh, better output in terms of these, uh, you know, moving structures. Because these moving structures, we know, we always, if we are observing from Earth or even from Lagrangian one point, we'll be looking at this object in the plane of the sky. And anything, any measurements you do in the plane of the sky will be subjected to always uh, some errors because you do not know the exact direction in which it is propagating. So uh, that, in, that information is very important if you really want to know whether these ejecta which is coming from the sun will anyway reach earth and when it will reach earth will all depend on this velocity properties and so on. So a stereoscopic reconstruction will give you a better estimate about their speeds and then you will be in a better position to talk about arrival time and all that. Uh, of course, uh, these are very generic uh, things that we all know that we are uh, in the presence of uh, Earth's magnetic field and we are protected and uh, uh, that, uh, that helps in our survival as well. I emphasize this point that if we would have restricted our, uh, you know, looking at the sun only in the optical test telescope, probably sun would have looked as a slightly boring object because uh, in the white light, you do see sunspots, but sunspots are not there every day. There are months uh, over which uh, uh, there are no sunspots at all. But we know now, even if you do not have sunspot, there are certain structures. And when you have such a sunspot, it just appears as a small little black dot on a white light. But if you look at other wavelengths, this is infrared, uh, you know, uh, 10, 830 uh, line. There already you see, uh, you know, slightly higher up in the atmosphere uh, of the sun in the chromosphere, you see some definite more structures. And if you go to ultraviolet or X-ray wavelengths, you see many more uh, structures on the sun. So sun, uh, you know, demands actually multi-wavelength. And we, as we know that whatever these magnetic structures, which is uh, visible on the surface, I, I am not going to talk about anything where these uh, structures are coming from underneath, of course, that are again a, a huge, you know, field in terms of the solar physics is concerned. But if you if you uh, want to study the solar atmosphere alone, you do need, uh, you know, multi wavelength. Then only you will be able to, you know, uh, talk about the coupling between the different uh, atmosphere and any structures which you see how it evolves, how much energy it uh, it, uh, it contains, and it, it eventually if it ejects, then how much energy it can carry. Uh, how fast it can carry through interplanetary space and so on. So multi-wavelength is the key. So, uh, so that's a picture of the active region, which I was talking about. This is just a one slide to just impress on you 
that even for a quiet sun, which used to be called quiet and boring, uh, this is an example of actually our, our coordinated effort. Uh, this is led by my former student. Uh, observations from uh, Goody Solar Telescope it, at Big Bear Solar Observatory. Now combining uh, our, you know, ground-based facility with the highest possible spatial resolutions and with space-borne uh, you know, uh, solar dynamic observatory. So this top layer, which is depicting the corona, uh, uh, and these three layers, uh, this is the magnetic field evolution at the, uh, from, a, uh, from infrared observations. As you can see, the bipolar nature of the magnetic field, very, very tiny, tiny magnetic field, its evolution, its time scale, and how these kind of magnetic flux cancellation events produces jets. These are called uh, in, the, in, the, in the traditional terms as uh, spicules, and these spicules do carry energy all the way to Corona. And if you could follow these locations of, the, of these uh, spicules, you will see there are certain brightening seen in the coronal height, which uh, you know, confirms the presence of a heating uh, because Corona's temperature need to be maintained at a million K. That's another, uh, another uh, different uh, topic, but basically to show that these high resolution observations combination of ground-based and and space-based platform is allowing us to get a, a top level, you know, publications. Of course, this was reported in science uh, almost a couple of years back from now, but it is a very good representative, uh, you know, example to show that today uh, modern day solar physics demands a, a combination of multi-wavelength and observations from ground and space, both. Uh, we can't probably do it uh, just by one. Uh, so now I will talk about for my rest of uh, 15 minutes uh, about this uh, Aditya mission. And I am actually co-chairing the science working group of uh, the Aditya mission. Aditya mission has seven payloads. And as you can imagine, this is indigenously built in India with the participation from many, many uh, institutions across India and also uh, many centers of ISRO. So I must say that ISRO uh, directly participates in instrument building uh, instrument, uh, you know, in, uh, you know, integration in the telescope and even in operation. Even the ground station is all supported by uh, by ISRO. The data center will be in ISRO. So I think a good coordination between ISRO and these individual institutions, which uh, which builds the instruments and also responsible for science operations and so on, uh, is is a really uh, exciting time uh, for all of us. Uh, a list of uh, instruments which is uh, going to be on Aditya. The, the major payload, I would say, uh, the biggest one is called the Visible Emission Line Coronagraph, VELC, to study the diagnostic parameter of the solar corona and dynamics and origin of mass ejections. I will very briefly talk about why we need uh, another coronagraph in space, because there are coronagraphs in space. So what are the, you know, uh, you know, elements which are not still available on space platform, we will try to identify those and try to build an instrument which can complement other uh, coronagraphic observations from space. Uh, this coronagraph will have three visible and one infrared channel and uh, a combination of, so as you can imagine, uh, a, a combination of imaging and spectroscopic capabilities with the spectropolarimetric capability as well in the infrared line. For the first time from space platform, we are planning to measure uh, get an estimate about the magnetic field in the corona. Uh, it will also have a solar full disk ultraviolet imaging telescope, which will operate in 200 to 400 nanometer. Majority of the uh, full disk uh, you know, images in the ultraviolet range, what is there from the space platform is in extreme ultraviolet. There are no uh, you know, near UV uh, you know, uh, images from space. So that also uh, motivated us to build a, a imaging uh, device with this wavelength region, because it will also allow us to do certain solar uh, irradiant studies. Uh, and that also has an impact with Earth's climate changes, uh, you know, consequences and so on. This is primarily built at Ayuka. Uh, the visible emission line coronagraph is actually being built at uh, IAA. And right now uh, we have a, uh, you know, uh, clean room facility of uh, class 10 at uh, another campus called Hosakote near Bangalore. And this is under integration now at this point of time. Then we have a particle detector as uh, we are going to Lagrangian one point. 
it's uh, pertinent to have a combination of uh, remote sensing and uh, in situ instruments. So first two was remote sensing, and then uh, we have uh, a few uh, you know particle uh, detectors. So this is uh, called aspects. Incidentally, it's being from uh, PRL. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, Sunil, it, uh, Shantosh is heavily involved with this instrument to study the variation of solar wind particles as well as distribution and spectral characteristics. Uh, we'll work in 20 keV to 20 MeV. We have another particle detector which is looking at slightly lower energy from 10 EV to 3 keV. This is being built in a solar physics laboratory in, in Trivandrum. This is another ISRO center who are building this uh, you know, uh, payload as well. Then we have two X-ray uh, solar spectrometer, uh, which will look at sun as a star. We do not have uh, capabilities of imaging in X-rays uh, right now, but there are two X-ray uh, solar spectrometers, uh, which will monitor the, uh, the, the fluxes, uh, at these, uh, you know, um, uh, energy range one to thirty kV, which will also have uh, a lot of, you know, line identification capabilities and so on. So through this spectroscopy, you could do uh, a lot of studies in terms of the FIP effect and, uh, you know, compositional studies uh, related to the flares, pre-flare stage, post-flare stage, and so on. Then you also have a high energy. Uh, you know, L1 orbiting X-ray spectrometer Helios, which will work into 10 to 150 kV. So as you can imagine that the hard X-rays uh, primarily for the big flares and all that will be dedicated for Helios with a bit of overlap from Solex, which is the low energy. So we'll have a, a little bit of overlap for cross calibration also. So this will be dedicated for uh, solar flare studies uh, particularly. And then uh, we will also have a magnetometer, which will look at the interplanetary magnetic field. This has been built at, uh, you know, LEOS. This is again, a ISRO center uh, at, at Bangalore. So that's a suite of, uh, you know, seven instruments, uh, which are going to be sitting on and then this uh, different portions of the, of the spacecraft. And as you can imagine, the big elephant, which is sitting on the top deck is this uh, Corona graph. Uh, and then on the side, it is uh, the suit instrument, the imaging instrument. Uh, this is a, a 175 kg payload, uh, which takes the majority of the, of the real estate uh, in, the, in the spacecraft. Why do we need uh, still a, a coronagraph? We are actually going to look at the inner corona. Uh, this is an example to show that the LASCO C2, which has been actually made a huge change in terms of the coronagraphy uh, and uh, you know, coronal physics and CME uh, kinematical studies is on SOHO, it's still fully functional, but its field of view starts beyond 2.45 solar radii. SOHO also had a C1 coronagraph, which were looking at uh, very close to the sun, 1.1 to uh, you know, uh, 1 uh, solar radii. But unfortunately, uh, because of certain technical uh, you know, problems in the early phase of SOHO, C1 was actually uh, lost. C1 uh, could not be revived after SOHO was again brought back to its orbit. So uh, C1 uh, had a very limited observations, but C1 looks at the inner corona. Of course, you can look at ground-based coronagraph, but with much low spatial resolutions and lots of atmospheric noises and uh, atmospheric, uh, you know, uh, 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 conditions always vary. So that also poses a serious uh, constraints on uh, inner coronagraphic observations from ground. Of course, total solar eclipse is ideal, but uh, we don't get total solar eclipses often. And uh, that uh, makes our uh, life also very similar. So after even 40 years of space coronagraphy, the low corona, less than two solar, uh, uh, the sun, remains practically unobserved, especially in the visible and infrared band. So Aditya mission will cover inner corona from 1.05 to three solar radii. So our focus is actually all in this region. And we hope that we'll be able to complement, uh, you know, other major corona graph from uh, ESA or NASA platforms. This is a larger coronagraph. Even C1 was a five centimeter coronagraph. I mean, we had the luxury of a little bit of space on the spacecraft. So we could build a very big uh, coronagraph with 20 centimeter primary mirror and uh, with the now modern uh, CMOS detectors and so on and so forth. We are able to take uh, many frames per second. 
you know, uh, earlier chronography images were restricted to every five minutes and so on. But if you really want to capture the, the fast dynamics, you need faster cadence. But again, faster cadence means a lot of data. But then again, uh, there are a lot of challenges. You are going to L1. Uh, will you be able to download such huge amount of data? So obviously not. So we have to have uh, onboard processing. We have designed a onboard uh, CMA detection algorithm. This, uh, uh, this work was done by my PhD student and it is now been implemented in a PGA uh, onboard. So we are actually very excited and also tense to see how those logical uh, you know, uh, things allow us to detect the CMEs. It's like a motion sensor camera. You can, uh, you can think it in an accrued term. This is going to be our field of view in the imaging channel, but we will have a spectral uh, capability. And we are for the first time also going to do a multi-slit spectroscopy. This also has lots of challenge. So we have uh, three uh, different cameras dedicated for three different ionized iron line. And we will have possibilities of these four slits looking at different portions of the sun. Even without uh, you know, uh, scanning, we could get uh, you know, uh, uh, spectral information from many different locations. So this is again, another beauty of the multi-slit spectroscopy. I think some of you are uh, getting into that domain, but this is the first time we are going to try it from space. I think so far it has been only attempted from ground. This is a close-up of that multi-slit spectro, uh, uh, you know, spectrometer. What we expect. So if you have a, have a, such a structure, you can you can really probe these structures in this region. You can probe this structure in the polar regions where there are open uh, polar field regions. We know they are called polar plumes. You should be able to characterize these kind of uh, you know helmet streamer structures. These are called streamers. So if you are slits. You can, of course, scan these uh, images. We can have sit and stare observation. We can have scanning mode observations, which will build a 2D spectral image uh, also. So lots of capabilities. Uh, what I wanted to highlight here in this slide is that sun is actually uh, changing over time. We all know. Here, there are four eclipse images as taken from two different filters. One is called the traditional red filter, one and 10 line and one and 15 line. And what it depicts is that if you superimpose these two uh, filter images, they always do not overlap. So that means the coronal plasma is multi-thermal with different character, you know, plasma properties and temperatures and so on and so forth, which also changes with time. So 2006 eclipse uh, image, 2008 eclipse image, and then as you approach the, you know, uh, the maxima and so on, your complexity and the structures and all that also uh, you know, enlarges uh, heavily. So these two lines have been traditionally observed during uh, total solar eclipses. So we have incorporated those two lines, uh, not exactly the, the red line, we have an orange line, which is uh, very similar to uh, properties in another ionization states of iron. So if you have two ionization states of iron, you can take the line ratios, and get a direct estimates of, uh, of temperature and so on through spectroscopy, not through filter images. You see, filter images always is uh, bound by the filter profiles and its characteristics with temperatures and, and, and so on. Whereas if you have a spectral line, and then if you have the atomic spectra well developed with this, with the Chianti and, uh, and such uh, atomic databases, you will be having a much better accurate measurements of, uh, of temperatures. This is just one slide to, uh, uh, to impress on you that uh, here what is plotted is the CME kinematics. This is, these are called the high time plot of uh, CME propagation. These are observational data taken from C2 and C3 coronagraph. Uh, based on these data are high time positions of the CME uh, leading front, people calculate the velocities and the acceleration. But what is to be noted here that there is hardly any, and these are theoretical you know, curve, which are tried to be fitted with the observed data. Uh, and the estimates are that, of course, velocity will start from uh, low numbers and then will accelerate. And then it goes to a saturation, very similar to it goes with the CMEs carry with the, with the solar wind speed and so on. But the lack of data points within this, uh, you know, very close to the sun really makes our understanding and all our modeling efforts uh, very, very you know, restrictive. So we are going to focus on this and we hope that our 
you know, inner corona graph will really, really be able to fill this data with much, much better accuracy. And one thing to be noted is no two CMEs are actually the same. So it's such a varieties of different CMEs are seen that generalizing such a model is also almost impossible. So it is actually desirable or absolutely necessary to have the CME kinematics captured in all different heights. So as I mentioned that we will be focusing on this close to the sun up to three solar radii. Our data points will be early up to here. But then of course we are completely, uh, I mean, hundred percent sure there will be other coronagraphs in space which will complement our data, will allow us to make this full, full, uh, full statistics. So the point is that I think we are moving into an era where you know, data from different sources, complementary sources, doing joint observing campaigns and all that are the need of the hour. And this is why the Science Working Group, we do uh, have started interaction with the Solar Orbiter. Uh, we are talking to the NASA partners as well. Uh, so this is important to have joint observing campaigns with uh, you know other missions. So there is a Chinese mission which is coming two years down the line. There would be a Proba three uh, mission uh, from ESA's platform. These are technology demonstrations, but they will have a coronagraph looking at very similar uh, height range with some other capabilities and so on. So this is important that we all work together to you know uh, populate these uh, data sources. Uh, the other element what I mentioned already is the magnetic structure of the uh, corona on large scale, how it is. This is all based on, this is again a, a, a work which is done by uh, one of our colleagues from, from India uh, called uh, Center for Space Science Institute in, in, in uh, Eastern part of India. I'm also a co-faculty there and Dibindu Nandi heads this uh, you know, center and uh, they're working in a lot of these magnetic field you know, uh, models. He works also on, on, on dynamos and so on, but now he's mostly focusing on on uh, on Earth's uh, uh, you know uh, atmospheric models as well, even planet and uh, you know uh, solar uh, CME interactions, uh, and of course uh, the the solar uh, coronal field reconstructions as well. So we are working together to see that how are these uh, you know models. Uh, on a global scale, scale, what are the time scale changes and all that, and if we can complement that with the with the uh, with the Aditya observations. This was actually an example of a comparison between the solar eclipse uh, observation and uh, Dibendu did this uh, models and published this in, in, in AppJ two days before the eclipse date uh, to uh, his predictions of the global field structures matched reasonably well. Of course, the similar work is done at, at US uh, Predictive Science Center uh, in California, and uh, they had certain differences, but then again, these differences allows us to move to the next uh, visible model. But uh, uh, qualitatively, these models are actually uh, matching with observations pretty well. So uh, that's all I wanted to talk about uh, our mission and about uh, Aries. So uh, we are all heading for uh, Lagrange in one point, hopefully sometime early next year. As you all have gone through, we are also been heavily affected by, by the pandemic. Uh, so a lot of our lab operations uh, had to be you know, completely restricted. A lot of equipments and uh, you know, component deliveries were uh, heavily affected. So we should have uh, you know, started our journey sometime this year. Uh, we should have already uh, handed over our payload by now, but uh, it's almost a one year delay. Uh, but we expect that we will be uh, traveling to the Lagrangian one point sometime in the middle of uh, next year. And I just like to point out that, you know, I have a good uh, bunch of uh, students, a combination of uh, physics students and engineering students, because we do, uh, you know, uh, handle a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, technical challenges in terms of um, data pipeline development and operations and so on. So I work uh, closely. That's a all learning, uh, you know, uh, lessons for me because I've never worked on any engineering thing. I come from a very theoretical physics uh, background with condensed matter physics as a specialization. But as he, I moved over in my career, I'm, I'm picking up uh, new stuff. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thanks a lot, Deepankar. It was really nice listening your uh, 
uh, journey and, and the kind of studies you do at uh, IA and ARIES. Basically, being um, a part of AstroSat, I have uh, gained some insight about instrumentation, or I should say that I have a, a kind of passion for instrumentation. So I'm, I'm really very much impressed to see that you have, uh, you are handling a lot of uh, data managing on board using FPGA. And then I was curious to know that uh, how you will be changing the size of uh, Corona, uh, uh, that uh, what a coronal mask, uh, mask for uh, uh, your changing the size of the inner size of the Corona. Yeah. So the uh, the size is actually not changing because once we reach it L1, uh, you know, the relative size will be the same always. So the coronagraph, uh, basically these are internal occulter. So there is a hole in the secondary. So the disc light is actually thrown out of the, uh, of the box. So we only reflect, so it's like a donut. So whatever uh, coronal uh, light is reflected on the donut solid surface, get again, subsequently get reflected to the M3 and, and M4 and so on. So we are restricted to 1.05 to 3 solar radii. So the field of view of uh, the imaging uh, channel is between 1.05 to 3 solar radii. Having said that, the spectral channels, we have three spectral channels there, which are going to look at only emission lines. So the emission line intensities falls off very dramatically. So there is no point actually going beyond 1.5 and so on. So there in those channels, the field of view is actually 1.05 to 1.5 solar radii. In that way, we have also going to achieve a better spatial resolution because your uh, your uh, uh, you know eventually the resolution and the field of view is restricted by the detector as well. So we have a 2K by 2.6K CMOS detector and uh, the, the, the optics and the, the primary mirror size and all that has uh, a, a enabled us to get the imaging channel between 1.05 to 3 solar radii and uh, you know for the for the spectral channel, 1.05 1, 1 to 1.5 solar area, very, very close to the sun. Okay, but since yeah. you asked this other uh, small little question, I didn't go into the details about this onboard algorithm, what we have decided. Um, mm -hmm. We have kept actually few free parameters because you know such an experiment has not been done from space at all. And nobody has really uh, a correct knowledge about, of course, the photon counts and all that. We all do it from our theoretical understanding and knowledge and so on, but nobody has measured it. So whether this exposure is going to be correct, when you take a say difference image, uh, how many uh, frame differences you will take? Huh? Suppose you want to do spatial binning, how many spatial binning you will be able to do? So we have kept in this algorithm, few parameters, which are called free parameters, which are programmable. So initially, there will be a set of parameters which will be loaded, but subsequently, say a few months down the line, if we see that these parameters are not optimal, we'll do certain simulations. We have done some simulations whereby we have chosen this parameter space, but then we will have a probability of changing those free parameters, like the how many uh, pixels you want to bin to improve the signal to noise. What would be the you know ideal, um, difference uh, frame taking because you know the problem with the uh, with the cmos director is takes images too quick and it also has a less uh, potential well so if you if you mm -hmm. give long exposure you you are saturated so all these things has to be uh, you know walked out then sometimes you know you may have to take different images uh, which are separated by a minute because if you are trying to capture something which is moving slow then uh, that object will move only very, I mean, it has to move at least few pixels to be able to capture it, right? So for that, you, you need another free parameter. So we have kept those provisions while, uh, while designing the algorithm. Okay. So uh, there, there, yeah, there will be a lot of questions, uh, but I, just, I will just ask one more and then we will, uh, we will take another. Just uh, curious to know, like uh, in, in AstroSight, we were, uh, uploading commands when it was available uh, to the sky of Bangalore. So will it be the same way for uh, yes. Uh, yes. as well? Yes, yes. In fact, uh, there are passes and uh, these are calculated. So twice in a day, you can only upload it. So 
uh, all these things are actually the programs which you want to run um, on the satellite. Uh, has, I mean, uh, ISRO has asked us 24 hours, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, limit. So we cannot actually uh, give any command beyond 24 hours. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, Vanisha, uh, can you please ask your question? Uh, thank you, uh, Deepanka, for that really great talk. Um, actually, most of my question was already answered by your previous discussion, but I just wanted to know what um, is the highest sort of or the shortest cadence that you can monitor with the coronagraph? Yeah, that, that, that's a very good question. So this detector had a possibility of 50 milliseconds as a shorter exposure. So we have designed it up to 100 milliseconds now. So it will have, uh, you know, 10 frames per second, uh, you know, capabilities. Also, since you asked the question, this is an interesting detector. It has uh, two, uh, you know, uh, two outputs. Incidentally, it can be operated at 1x and 3x, 1x at 5x or 3x at 5x. So it, it gives two output with uh, this multiplication factor. So this could be a quite a useful thing to do uh, for say combination of inner corona and outer corona because as i was mentioning that the intensity falls off very uh, uh, drastically so when you are at the uh, edge of the field of view uh, beyond, beyond say 2.5 to 3 solar radii it will be very challenging to get uh, sufficient signal at all so we will be uh, you know uh, experimenting with this two uh, multiplicative uh, factor output as well okay thank you so maybe Nick, uh, you can ask this question yourself. Um, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Um, yeah, I was just interested in this L1 location. Um, is there space for many, many satellites or will people start fighting over this location in future? <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. Although the diagram it shows as a point, but basically uh, you need to uh, make a huge halo orbit around that L1. So, uh, and that orbit is very, very uh, big. So uh, even if there are uh, probably about a thousand satellites in that uh, orbit will not uh, be, you know, uh, be difficult to accommodate, <laughs> so to say. But you're, you're right. Uh, it gives the impression that L1 is, is strictly a point, but essentially, you know, it's, it's not possible to stay at one point. So they make a very huge halo orbit around that L1 point. But, uh, you know, uh, once you reach L1, you know, uh, you know, the two forces balance each other. So they don't need to really, uh, you know, spend too much of fuel. So that's like another advantage of going to uh, L1 point uh, that you can stay very long uh, there. You need to just, you know, correct uh, your path time to time when there is a drift and things like that. That's what my understanding. Yeah. yeah. But I guess there will still be a sweet spot that is like the prime spot because that's where the fuel consumption will be the least, right? Uh, yeah, but it appears that, you know, it is very, uh, it's almost impossible to actually stay at one point in any case. So they would uh, make a, uh, you know, orbit around that point uh, with the th thing, you know, that the distance, uh, that the force between the Earth and the satellite uh, essentially uh, balances between the force between the satellite and the, and the sun. Okay. It's actually only 1% of the distance between sun and earth. People have an impression, I mean, this is not to scale this particular uh, diagram, which is also plotted. So it's only 1% uh, of the distance between uh, the sun and earth we travel to. Okay, great. Uh, if we have any other question, please ask. Okay. So I, I will go to my question. Uh, Dipanka, it's really nice to see that it, it has a lot of uh, instruments on board. And uh, your one focus is to understand the magnetic field properties of the sun in, in uh, basically in coronal part and inner part as well. So do you also have uh, polar polarimetric facilities on board, Aditya? Yes, yes, very much. I didn't go into the details. I do not. We have a spectropolarimetric channel. So that's the thing, because you see, uh, for the coronal uh, thing, Zeeman effect doesn't 
you know, give you because you won't get much splitting at all. So only possibility is spectral polarimetry to, to give. So we will have all the four strokes, uh, you know, parameter uh, determination. So we have a retarder and all those uh, elements also in, in the infrared channel. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, any uh, further questions from uh, anyone? Okay. So, if not, uh, it was really nice uh, having you uh, on board the bunker. It was really nice journey with Atya and uh, solar physics. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh,